welcome back everybody. Today we are going to continue our discussion about compromise and plans to try and save the union and to keep the union together that we started yesterday when we talked about the Missouri Compromise. So as we all know, Missouri Compromise didn't fully work, but people are going to keep trying. So today we're going to continue in our discussion and look at how a plan to try and save the Union would further inflame the tensions between the North and the South. Now, I've also done audio recordings for today, so if you choose to use those, click below the give and take buttons, or as I call them, the compromise buttons, because we'll be talking about compromise again today. Um, but if not, let us continue by looking at our key terms. And our key terms for today are secede, fugitive, civil war, and that is a war between people of the same country, the Compromise of 1850, and with it, the Fugitive Slave Act. And we will end today talking about Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I mentioned earlier that in our previous lesson, we talked about the Missouri Compromise of 1820 and how it was meant to help calm the debate over slavery. Now, do you think that compromise will prevent further controversy about the issue of slavery, or was it more of a short-term solution? What about new states that want to be admitted to the Union? We also know from our previous lessons that at this time, new territories were being expanded into, and uh, the United States was pushing, continue to push westward uh, as part of Manifest Destiny. Well, all of these territories that we are now claiming and we're uh, winning or purchasing eventually are going to become states. So what about these new states when they want to be admitted to the Union? In order to keep a balance in the Senate, states must be admitted in twos, one slave, one free. So our first video is going to kind of give us a backdrop of this and uh, tell us about what was going on in the 1840s, 1850s, and give a brief overview about what we will be discussing today. So after that, we will pick up with our discussion. Just as women's rights would be an ongoing issue for many years, the debate over slavery continued for decades. An earlier compromise the Compromise of 1820, also known as the Missouri Compromise, had not ended the controversy over slavery. A whole collection of outstanding sectional issues had been kind of swept under the rug after the Compromise of 1820. But the problem of slavery and the associated sectional tensions popped up in odd places. But the issue doesn't die. And as a matter of fact, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, the South begins to, to well, it needs to expand into the new territories. Soil exhaustion, uh, various factors. Slavery, unless it can expand, is probably is going to die. At least the Southerners felt that way. And they also felt that slaves were property. And how could Congress, if it prohibited the South from taking their slaves into the territories, they would be depriving the South of property. I mean, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? I mean, human beings are, that's the way they looked at it. So there were practical economic reasons for the expansion of slavery into the territories, and there was also this question of Southern honor, to be treated as second-class citizens, not to be allowed to take your property. As America grew and new states were added, like Arkansas and Michigan in 1836 and 1837, respectively, congressional debates were very heated over whether new states would be slave states or free states. This is the question that wouldn't die. And it was a question that you couldn't compromise politically. The debate in Congress became more complex when Texas was admitted to the Union in 1845. Texas was admitted as a slave state, but the vast area Texas claimed as hers was a matter of dispute. 
The territories acquired from Mexico as a result of the Mexican War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo were also in question. Would they be slave or free? California was another part of the problem. The territory which had grown dramatically with the discovery of gold in 1849 applied for statehood as a free state. But the discovery of gold in California, the tremendous migration to California on a free or commercial basis presented the country with California in 1850 with sufficient population to be admitted as a state but eager to come in as a free state with no counterbalancing slave state. Uh, this would throw out of balance the equality in the Senate between slave and free state. Still another dispute involved the nation's capital itself, Washington, D.C. It not only permitted slavery, but it was a center for the slave trade industry. The president at the time was James K. Polk. He suggested extending the Missouri Compromise Line westward to the Pacific Ocean. Representative David Wilmot of Pennsylvania introduced his Wilmot Proviso in Congress. It would have banned slavery in all lands that would be acquired from Mexico. Neither Polk's suggestion nor Wilmot's Proviso won support in Congress. Anti-slavery politicians from both the Whig and Democratic parties broke away and formed a new faction, the Free Soil Party. The Free Soilers, as they were called, demanded that Congress prohibit the expansion of slavery into new territories. A compromise of some sort seemed to be the only solution. For a while after the Missouri Compromise, states were able to enter the Union very peacefully. But when California asked to enter in 1850, that's when uh, all the problems that we saw back in 1820, a lot of them came right back up. Just like in 1820, in 1849, there were the same number of slave states and free states. At that point, there were 11. Now there are 15 of each. So that gave a balance in the Senate of slave and free. And having this balance in the Senate is very important. California's admission would tip the balance to the free states, but it wasn't just California. It also looked like Oregon, Utah, and New Mexico all wanted to enter as free states. So that would severely tip the balance uh, away from the South. Instead of 15 to 15, it would now be 19 to 15. Many Southerners felt that by admitting these four states as free states would give them no chance in the Senate, and some even went so far as to propose to secede, and uh, secede means to remove yourself from a situation, uh, and in this case, they would seceding would be removing themselves from the United States to start their own country. Northerners argued that California should be free because most of it was north of the line drawn by the Missouri Compromise, remember the Wilmot Proviso. So something had to be done. So in steps Mr. Henry Clay, who we are looking at right now, standing in the center, addressing the Senate in 1850. And Clay had earned that nickname of the Great Compromiser because he was instrumental in helping to settle the Missouri Compromise. Now, 30 years later, he would have to do it again in order to keep the nation together. Opposing Clay was John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Now. Calhoun was too ill to speak to the Senate himself, so James Mason of Virginia read Calhoun's speech. And in the speech, Calhoun refused to compromise and insisted that slavery should be allowed in the territories. In his mind, and in the mind of many Southerners, as we saw in that first video, slaves were property, and by denying Southerners the right to take their property into the new territories, that was a violation of their rights. He also demanded that fugitive slaves, or runaway slaves, be returned to their owners because, technically, they were the property of their owners.
If the North wouldn't agree to these terms, then Calhoun stated that the South was, quote, more than willing to use force to leave the Union. So, Southern approach, slavery should be allowed in the territories, and if not, many of the Southern states were willing to leave and start their own country. So, next up to speak was this man, Mr. Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. He agreed with Clay that the country needed to stay intact and believed that if the South were to secede, that there would be no way that it could be done peacefully. Remember Calhoun saying that the South was more than willing to use force. Um, so Webster saw this and said, if the South is going to leave, there's no way that it can be done peacefully. Uh, and he feared that states would end up in a bloody civil war or a war between people of the same country. He personally thought that slavery was evil, so he held to the abolitionist view that slavery was evil, but he thought that the breakup of the nation would be even worse than the evils of slavery. So in order to save the Union, he was willing to compromise and would support the Southern demands to return fugitive slaves. So to kind of illustrate how bad things were and how intense the situation was, some congressmen and senators started carrying concealed knives and guns to Congress because they were scared that a huge fight would erupt in Congress. One senator said that the only congressman not carrying a gun was the one that was carrying two guns. And once, one of the pistols went off accidentally, and almost immediately, 30 to 40 guns were in the air, ready to, ready to fight back. The scene in Congress was described as looking more like a barroom than the Congress of the United States of America. So, in this, in this situation, do you think that anyone was really able to get any work done if they were bringing knives and guns right into Congress? Uh, if fighting was about to break out here in what's considered to be the highest law of the land, then it's probably a good guess that the rest of the country was feeling the same way. The 1850s is, in many ways, a Cold War getting hotter. <laughs> A series of crises beset the nation, beginning ironically with a compromise, a compromise that proved quickly bankrupt. You had the giants of American political life. You had Henry Clay of Kentucky, a Whig, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, John C. Calhoun, the great senator from South Carolina, engage in debate over the future of the nation. Would that future include slavery? As one historian, Bill Barney, has pointed out there's a concern in the South that the land open to slavery remains constant and the slave population continues to grow at the rate of roughly 25 percent per 10-year period per census. Pretty soon you're going to have slaves chasing runaway masters. So benevolent diffusion was the phrase used on one or two occasions about opening up more of the land gained from the Mexican War in the American West to the slave plantation system. These aging senators, Clay, Calhoun, and Webster, whose voices have influenced decades of legislation, dominate the first phase of the debate. In fact, Clay offers a compromise proposal. Which outlawed the slave trade, the buying and selling of African Americans in the District of Columbia that passed a very stringent Fugitive Slave Act, which addressed the concerns of some Southerners, which organized new territories without the mention of slavery, thus allowing the people who settled those regions to determine the future of slavery in that area. Admitted California as a free state, adopted some of the debt that Texas had been building up ever since the Texas Revolution in 1836. In any event, the, the Compromise of 1850 was supposedly an omnibus bill. It had every, something for everyone. Unfortunately, it really didn't solve any problems. So these debates over whether or not uh, 
California, Utah, Oregon should be let in as free states or if they should be forced to be slave states. Uh, and the arguing back and forth in Congress continued through 1850. But before things were able to be resolved, Calhoun passed away, as did President Zachary Taylor. Now, President Taylor did not support the plan for compromise, but the new president, Millard Fillmore, did support Clay's plan. And I want to kind of take a little bit more in-depth look at what made up the Compromise of 1850 in a little bit more detail. So the Compromise of 1850 really had five major parts. First, California would enter the Union as a free state, like it wanted. Second, the rest of the Mexican Cession was divided up into the territories of New Mexico and Utah, and voters in each territory would decide about slavery for themselves, or popular sovereignty. Number three, the slave trade in Washington, D.C. would end, but Congress would have no power to ban trade between slave states. Number four, a very strict fugitive slave law was included in this compromise, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And number five, uh, the Compromise of 1850 would also settle a border dispute between Texas and New Mexico, kind of making up the border as it looks to this day. So California enters as a free state. The rest of the Mexican session was divided up into New Mexico and Utah, and voters would decide there using popular sovereignty. Number three, the slave trade in D.C. would end, but uh, trade between slave states would continue, and Congress would have no jurisdiction over that. Number four, a very f strict fugitive slave law was included, and number five, a border dispute between Texas and New Mexico was settled. Now, I mentioned that the fourth part of the Compromise of 1850 included a Fugitive Slave Law. Well, this Fugitive Slave Act required all citizens to help catch runaway slaves. I'm going to repeat that. The Fugitive Slave Act required all citizens to catch runaway slaves. If anyone let a slave escape, he would be fined up to $1,000 and put in jail. New courts were set up just for these uh, fugitive slave cases, and suspects were not allowed a jury trial. It was you met in front of a judge, and he decided your fate. And in these courts, the judges were awarded $10 for sending accused runaways back to the South, but were only awarded $5 for setting someone free. Can you see where this is going? Yes. Uh, many judges became greedy and sent African Americans back to the South, even if they weren't runaway slaves. So free men, uh, slaves that had acquired their freedom, slaves that had been born in the North, it didn't matter. If you were accused of being a runaway slave, there was a very, very good chance that you were going to be sent to the South to become a slave if you had not been one already. And this law really angered a lot of people in the North who opposed slavery um, because they were now being forced to catch runaway slaves. And by doing so, they were forced to take part in the slave system that they hated so much. And each time it was enforced, it actually convinced more and more Northerners that slavery was evil. So if you remember back to yesterday's discussion, how I had the, the image of the seesaw and some people were kind of in the middle and were moderates, well, this fugitive slave law was causing more people that had been moderate or indifferent on the issue of slavery and was starting to push them more towards the abolitionist side. So this compromise, the Compromise of 1850, was supposed to end the debate over slavery for good, but it actually increased the tensions, and those tensions remained and were built on because neither side really got what it wanted.
Well, the Compromise of 1850, which was a product of the genius of the great Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser, was supposed to be the final word on the question of slavery. Uh, slavery was to be no longer uh, an issue of debate in American political discourse. Unfortunately, the compromise was just that. It was a compromise. It was not a resolution. And it did not stop people in the North from thinking that somehow their interest had been shortchanged for those of the South. Here's what his plan would do. Texas would relinquish its disputed territory, an area amounting to one-third of all its land. In exchange, Texas would receive $10 million from the federal government. The territories of New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah would be organized without mention of slavery. The decision to be slave or free would be left to the states. California would be admitted as a free state. The District of Columbia would no longer be a center for buying and selling of slaves, but slave holding would still be permitted. Finally, as a compensation to those in favor of slavery, the Fugitive Slave Act would be made law. Of all the parts of the Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was the most controversial. What particularly irritated the uh, people of the North was the uh, provision for a new Fugitive Slave Act, which now required uh, Northerners to return runaway slaves to the South. Not only were runaway slaves uh, un unallowable, that someone's labor force um, had disappeared, but that law enforcement was to uh, return them. And if they knew of someone that had uh, left, they were to um, return them or they were held liable for the lo that loss of labor. So it was very much slaves at that point were seen as instruments and tools of labor, not as human beings, not as those that would have equality at all. The Underground Railroad was this movement to ferret slaves out of the South to the free territory of the North, and in some cases even into Canada. It had operatives like Harriet Tubman who would help slaves to escape into the land of freedom. Uh, slaves were often disguised, uh, moved by night in wagons, or um, somehow put on ships and sent to ports where they would disembark to be met by groups in the North called vigilance committees who would help them then establish themselves as free people in Northern Territory. Speaking in favor of Clay's proposal, fellow Senator Daniel Webster, a very persuasive speaker, presented strong arguments in favor of the Compromise of 1850. The Senate passed the proposal but it did not end the debate over slavery. Now, the last thing that I would like to talk about uh, for today is an event that occurred in 1852 that took this growing anti-slavery mood in the North and pushed it even further. Now, it wasn't a battle or an argument in Congress. It was a book. Harriet Beecher Stowe, a writer from New England, published uh, this now well-known novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and she did so to show the evils of slavery and specifically the evils of the Fugitive Slave Act. The book told the story of Uncle Tom, and Uncle Tom was a slave who was well known for his kindness and piety. Piety is uh, virtue, uh, having reverence for God, holiness, etc., etc. So, very pious and kind individual. Uh, and he was bought by the evil slave master, Simon Legree. And in the story, Uncle Tom knows the whereabouts of two escaped slaves, but refuses to tell Simon Legree where they are. Eventually, Legree whips him to death for not telling him. Well, the book gained a very wide following in the North, and in the years up to the civil, leading up to the Civil War, it outsold every book except for the Bible. So, very widespread.
and it was even translated into about 20 languages. And the most remarkable quality about the book is the wide variety of viewpoints that it that it offered. And it did so through the very wide variety of characters. Each character represented a different viewpoint on slavery. You had male and female, free and enslaved, uh, enlightened and bigoted, educated and ignorant, northern, southern, old, young, and so on and so on. So each of these characters that Stowe used was meant to represent a different viewpoint on slavery. And at the end of the book, Stowe remarked about the, quote, incorruptible fidelity, piety, and honesty of Uncle Tom, and about how no matter what, he could not be provoked to violence. Now, the book was widely popular in the North, but in the South, many people objected to it and claimed that it didn't give a true or accurate picture of slave life. And to be completely honest, that is that is pretty true, because uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe had very little first-hand experience seeing slavery. But regardless, the book helped to change the way that many, many Northerners felt about slavery and helped them to realize that it wasn't just a problem for Congress to solve. More and more Northerners started seeing slavery as not just a Southern problem, but a moral problem facing every American. And for this reason, Uncle Tom's Cabin is considered one of the most important books in American history. It's one of the most divisive books in American history, but it is still one of the most important because it helped to change the way that many people felt about slavery and seeing it as not just a problem for Congress, but a problem for all Americans. And our final video is going to talk about the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin on the American public. And following this video, we'll pick up with our assignment for today. The writer Harriet Beecher Stowe was the daughter of an abolitionist minister in Cincinnati, Ohio. Stowe lived along the Ohio River, a border between slavery in Kentucky and freedom in Ohio. She often visited plantations in Kentucky, and she grew deeply troubled by the miserable conditions in which slaves lived and the injustice of slavery itself. She witnessed the back-breaking labor of the slaves as well as the brutal way their owners treated them. Spurred to action, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, a novel about a runaway slave who was eventually captured and sold back into slavery. Stowe depicted the cruelty of slave owners and the humanity of slaves. Many readers were stunned by the book's graphic descriptions of the harsh treatment of slaves. The book became an instant bestseller and highlighted the issue as a moral question of right versus wrong. Before Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, many Northerners had been unconcerned about slavery. But now many people viewed Stowe's book as evidence of slavery's immorality. Southerners called the book propaganda, claiming it did not describe slavery and slave owners fairly. They grew more suspicious of the North because they felt their rights and their way of life were under attack. Southerners wondered how their economy could survive without slaves and why Northerners wanted to take away their rights. I promised you an assignment and here it is. Uh, on the next page, uh, you will have a quick review uh, quiz over the terms, the people, and the major events from this section. So, um, Compromise of 1850, uh, Henry Clay, the Great Compromiser, and what went into the terms of the Great Compromise, and then there will be some questions about Uncle Tom's Cabin and its impact in the North and in the South. All right, um, with that, I wish you a I wish you good luck, and if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Have a great rest of your day.